Good evening and welcome back. This is Ethelred, the worst Civ player on YouTube. Let's play some Civ. It's 400 AD. And we found a barbarian camp. Oh my goodness. All the way over here. Imagine that. No, I... I find it hard to believe that Denmark hasn't already discovered me, but in case they haven't, I haven't seen their units over here. We'll let it go. So, what's happening? In 401 AD, Rome finally gave up the ghost in controlling Britain. It was too expensive in both money and lives to continue their occupation of Rome. And with a whimper, they withdrew. And the legions were withdrawn from Britain. A year later, the economic collapse followed. Um, although it wasn't an equally dramatic collapse in all places of Britain, there are evidence that in some places they were still laying in things like mosaic floors. Uh, and that persisted for a couple of years after the withdrawal of the legions. In other places, it was swift. Uh, 403 AD, by now, the Angles have got wind that the legionnaires are gone and there's no one defending Britain. At this point, one of two things happen. It depends on how you want to read history. Either on, I think the primarily the accepted opinion is that they, they meaning the Angles, meaning anyone who could get together 200 or so men, decided to go become a king. Hey, let's go s get 200 of our friends together and carve out a portion of Britain for ourselves. Or it was simply a mass movement of migration to fertile lands. Whatever you prescribe to, the fact is is that the legionnaires weren't here to keep the angles out anymore and they came over either with swords drawn or sheathed in great numbers. By 404 AD, the economic output, the industrial output, I guess it wasn't industrial, or, yeah, but the economic output of Britain had fallen such that it would not return to levels matching the Roman occupation until 1400 AD. That's a thousand years of slump. So we thought that the Great Recession was bad. In 410, there's a letter from Rome that we have in our possession to one of its formerly outlying districts rejecting a plea for help. It's believed that this was in response to a plea from Britain saying, come help us, the Angles are here. But mm, it's not exactly clear. And as a disclaimer, for the next 400 years or so, I've got plenty to talk about. But there's an asterisk besides every year because we don't really know what was happening in each year. Uh, it's just because we don't have records. We don't have written records. So the, the, the whole timekeeping thing becomes very chancy. All right, what are we going to build here now that the water reel is done? I'm thinking a shrine. And here I'm thinking a coliseum. Yes, something like that. Hmm, is a shrine required for a temple? Does it say on the tooltip? Yeah, building unlocked temple. And temples will give us happiness. So that's a stepping stone to a happiness building for us. And now we're friends with Wittenberg. Oh goody, and we can clear another barbarian encampment. So, after this cargo ship is done, we're going to get out another settler. And then maybe uh, another worker. Yes, something like that. In fact, I would kind of like to do maybe a settler and then a cargo ship. Yep, for the apples, so that we can ship apples. We're going to get away from the scary barbarians. And we're going to roll a turn. You know what I would really enjoy doing is I would enjoy getting the Huns and the Mongols to fight one another. Enemy horseman has attacked my archer. Where? Here? Run away. And oh good, we've got a farm done here. I think we're going to go work on another farm, by golly. And we're going to drive this horseman into the sea. 
Okay, well, we're gonna fortify and look sternly at the horseman and hope that he throws himself into the sea. Meanwhile, we are going to try to sneak by. I don't know if he'll actually attack me or not. In fact, can we have peace with him? Wait a minute. You're Arabian. Yeah, sorry, clicked on the wrong guy. No, I can't negotiate peace. That's just... Mm, yeah, I am tired of... Oh, this battle's exhausting. I can't take any more of this battle. Whatever. 430 AD. What, do I have anything? No. I can click next turn without talking about history for a little while. And uh, in 441, it looks like... Oh, goody. Currency. We'll use that to build markets. Hmm. And I think that we will go right for civil service for the food, food increase. Does the sea count as fresh water? Or is it only rivers? Well, anyway, we've got a fair number of rivers. Get out of here, horse. Yeah, so there's some scant evidence that in 441 AD the British looking to the Angles saw an opportunity to get help with I guess what was a problem apparently a problem for them was the Picts and the Scots you would have thought that they would have just rejoined as one big happy family once the Romans were gone and, and Hadrian's Wall was you know made nothing more than a thing on a map but first, I guess that there was uh, enmity bred by the last 400 years or so, and the Picts and Scots were apparently a problem. And it appears, and I keep saying appears, because remember, history is very sketchy in this time frame. But it appears that the Brits asked the Angles for help, and they may have received it. Let me set a timer here for myself so I don't talk for too long. I don't want the episode to go too late. Yes, we'll set it for two hours and 27 minutes. We'll do it. No, I'm just kidding. I'm being sarcastic. All right. 445. We will bring this archer home. And this fellow will continue to explore the east. I guess there's no Russia, but there's... Oh, there's Karakakorum. Am I... Where's my little trireme? I love this thing. I should name this. Can I rename this? I think with the extended user interface I can. While defending, your archer killed a barbarian horseman. I wish that I could click on something to go see where that is, but I think that that was probably right here. Yep, there it is. Really, that's very nice. Great, so we got the experience points for that. Farm. And I want to rename you. I can! Great. The little... Oh, it won't take. Hmm. Little... Tri... Ream. We'll just call it Little Tri Ream. Huh. Looks like there's a naval war going on over there. We'll leave them to it. 460. We got anything? Oh, yeah. All right, so the Brits outnumbered the Angles 4 to 1 in Britain, but nevertheless, the Angles started to uh, put a lot of cultural pressure onto the Brits. You could think of it like um, the Angles were winning a cultural victory against the Brits, and it's speculated as to why, right? So it may be that the Angles somehow managed to gain control of the levers of economy such that if you wanted a job, if you wanted uh, uh, you know, to get gold, weapons, etc., you would have to speak Old English and you would have to work for Angles. I mean, I can only guess as to how this all came to be. Um, and frankly, I don't think anyone knows. But anyway, they... They set up the situation 
where not only were they becoming culturally dominant, but they were also increasingly controlling the economy of Britain. And, as I mentioned earlier, you were starting to have two languages spoken simultaneously to one another. You were having uh, British being spoken by people, the locals, who were increasingly working for and becoming peasants to the Yangles. Uh, what did I say? Uh, it was Brythonic being spoken by the, by the peasants. And Old English being spoken by the Angles. So that if they were to be able to work with one another, then the Angles would speak Old English with some Brythonic, and the peasants, the indigenous, would speak some Brythonic and some Old English. And you got this combination of languages like Spanglish today in America, where you spoke a little bit of each. And that pidgin changed Old English permanently. Um, of the two languages, yip, run away, run away, or run away. Old English emerged a victor. That's why we speak English, we don't speak Brythonic. But it was permanently changed. It was no longer purely synthetic, which is the, uh, the language which is based on conjugation. It had been affected by the syntactical Brythonic, so that now syntax mattered as well as conjugation. We have verb tenses in English. We have past tense, um, chop, chopped, so we conjugate, but we also care about the syntax. And this combination of syntactical and synthetic elements comes from the fact that uh, back at this period of time, 500 AD, you had Old English speaking Angles working with on a daily basis the Brythonic speaking peasants. What else has happened around this time? 520? Um, do, 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 do. Spoke about the languages. Ooh, something really exciting happened in 495. I'll get to that as soon as I click next turn. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to assign... Let's find out who the tech leader is. It's Denmark. Can you imagine that? All right, we're going to go spy on Copenhagen. And if they're the tech leader, who's right behind them? 25 technologies, 23, 23, 22, 18, 24. Oh, Arabia. So let's go spy on Arabia. Mecca. What did I just click? Clicked wrong. Mecca. There we go. All right. So we got those guys out. And one step forward. One step back. No, we'll just park it right there because I can't move anymore. And we will start to send food to York while getting our fourth settler together. We've. I want to get five cities out before the Renaissance. So we have precious little time left to do that. Okay, so yes. What is drama? 495. There was a fellow of fantastic impact to the history of the English. And his name was Churdich and his son Chinrich. They got together a band of 250 Angles and they came over to Britain. Now, Churdich is a Brythonic name. So there's some speculation as to who Churdich was. There's at least three different um, ideas in this regard. One, that Churdich was a Roman Briton living on the continent, working as an alderman, which is a, like a high-level bureaucrat, and seeing the opportunity that anyone who could get 200 or so angles together could go become a king in Britain, decided to take advantage of the opportunity, having 250 fellow followers of his own, thought, yeah, it's, I'm going to go be a king. That's one idea. Another idea was that Churdich was a Welsh prince who had sympathies for the Angles and was kicked out of Wales and decided to go get his revenge. So he got 250 friends together from the Angles and came back. I, I, I don't know. I'm sure there's reasons why people believe that. I don't get it. And the third one is is that Churdich was an angle. It's just that he had a 
British mother, and he got his name from her. Anyway, this fellow Churich and his son Chinrich, they come over in 495, and they fight a British king named Natanliod and defeat him, but don't kill that king and establish a miniature little kingdom in in Britain. What was the name of it? Do I have it here? I'm I'm looking in my notes here. Well, I don't, but and maybe I'll find it later in the notes. But anyway, it wasn't called um, what it would eventually become until later. Churdich and Chinrich set up a kingdom which would be the land of the West Saxons. And over time, that kingdom would become to, come to be known as Wessex. And the House of Wessex is from which all of the Eng English kings after the unification of England have drawn their line. So Queen Elizabeth II is of the House of Wessex, if I'm correct. So all of the royalty of England has come from the, these two men, Churdich, Churdich and Chinrich, who came across in 495. In 508, Churdich got, finally finished a deal with Nathan Leode and killed him in a second battle expanding his territory of the West Saxons. And in 519, Churdich fought at Churdichenslaeg, now known as Charford or Churdich's Ford, further expanding the land of the West Saxons. So this guy was effective in battle. Uh, let's see. 530, sometimes here about plus or minus 100 years, it looks like the Brits and the Angles fought a major battle uh, called the Battle of Baden in which a British warrior won the day. So, this is now this, the Battle of Baden, and what I'm about to tell you here, it, you should understand that this is all very speculative. The fact that I had to lead into the, the Battle of Baden by saying right about 530 plus or minus 100 years, so this is speculated, but there's some evidence to it, that a, a local indigenous Briton rallied his men and won apparently a massive battle against the Angles and was renowned then as one of the locals turned out great. And if there is a historical kernel of truth to the story of King Arthur, it's suspected that it was this fellow. Um, and I want to take just a moment to talk about the legend of King Arthur. So in King Arthur, you know, you had the Lady of the Lake whose hand came up out of the lake and handed him a sword. What does that sound like? That sounds like the ancient Celtic bog traditions of throwing a sword into a bog in order to please the land so that you could cross it. And here you have the land giving a sword back to one of its indigenous heroes so that he could defend the land. This is, a, the, the literature major in me just finds such beautiful symmetry in this. I mean, this is, this is a moray of a culture being played out right here. You, you give a sword, you give an offering to a land so that the land can smile on you. And then when you, who have been the good steward, of the land or in your greatest hour the land gives something back to you take this weapon and smite your foes with it because I'm on your side that's what I see from the hand coming up out of the out of the lake giving King Arthur a sword so in 534 Churdich died and he passed his dynasty to his son Chinrich ah yes here it is I've got the name of it it wasn't called Wessex at the time it wasn't even called the land of the West Saxons it was called Goessa. Goessa. Okay. Well, I've blathered. We can play some we can play some Civ again. After all, you're probably here for the Civ. Uh unit needs orders. Just camp here. It'll save me some gold because of that social policy I have. And can we ever sneak by? Well, maybe we can. Ha ha ha! The little dry made it a whole several steps. 
I want to circumnavigate the world with this guy. And peace with the Arabs, because really I have no, I have no uh, bones. Ah, they're everywhere. They're all around me. Retreat. Gee whiz, there's a lot of them. Um, I think actually I'm going to end my turn right here and hope that this one galley actually, no, I'm, I'm going to play it safe. Okay, Archer, you go ahead and just wait here. Now, we're at a situation where eight turns from now we're going to get a settler. So in about 16 turns, we're going to be setting up a fourth city down here. That will set us back about five happiness. That happiness will be partially offset by this Colosseum, and then partially offset by a temple in York. It's kind of my plan. Let's see. What else do I need to do? This warrior, he will camp. So we're down to just negative three gold. And... Um... I really want to fight these galleys, but I also don't want to get myself in a position where I, I die the next turn. Oh, great! I was afraid that I wouldn't be... Even... Ah, oh, jeez. The science situation now is just so bad. Okay, great. So, maybe they're building their spaceship now? 24 technologies. They're not the technology leader. Now, that surprises me. I really want to fight this one barbarian, but there's another one. So I'm sure lots happened in history. 580, let's see. Get my notes. Chinrich goes on the warpath for the land of the West Saxons, wins a battle against the British. This was Wessex's favorite pastime. And I'm going to get into this a little bit more later, but um, a bunch of Angle kingdoms sprout up right around now. Some of them get really big. You'll, you'll become familiar with all of their names before long. But Wessex, more than the others, seems to, in my reading, have really enjoyed beating up on the Brits. And this was their primary means of expansion. So anyway, Chinrich wins a battle against the British at Fort Sarum, which is outside Salisbury. And that was at a strategic conjunction of trade routes. So Chinrich was going after the trade routes. And then again in 556, he fought again at Barrenborough, which most likely these days, that's the site of Barbary Castle. And he won there in order to control yet more trade routes. So with these battles, he expanded the lands of the West Saxons. In 560, Chinrich died, uh, with little else being recorded to his name besides the two battles that he won. His son, Chorlin, became Bretwalder. Okay, so I'm going to talk for just a moment about Angle culture while I take this turn. One is, well, there's, there's a lot to say, actually. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk first about um, the peasants. So the peasants had a relationship with the king that was direct. There was no intermediary. All right, so because I guess society back then was still small enough that you could do that. Literally, the peasants had a, I serve the king, not I serve a duke who serves the king. We weren't, we weren't in feudalism. All right. Another thing is that there were a couple of classes of people besides king and peasant. There were thanes who were basically what would eventually become noblemen. You could think of them as the uh, circle of friends that surrounds the king that all carry swords and axes. Warriors, because the king was a warrior. Full stop. King was a warrior, and so his best buddies, his drinking guys, he'd sit around and drink beer with and then go out and fight. These were his thanes. Right? And he also had some men in his employ who would handle the day-to-day -day running of, the, of his kingdom. And these people were called aldermen. Now, there would be occasions where everybody needed to get together and have a conversation about what they were going to do. And interestingly enough, this would include the wise men of the peasants. And it was called a moot. So, for instance, uh, I don't know, how do we dam up this river or something like that? And they'd get everybody together to talk about it, and it would be a moot. 
All right. Uh, let's see. What else should I say? I should say run away from the barbarians. I'll say that. What else about their organization? So, oh yeah. Temple for the happiness. Yes, I believe that a temple will be wise. A temple will be wise. Ooh, 30 turns. That's expensive. A coliseum is also 30 turns. The fact is, is that city just sucks, and that's the problem. All right, so... Okay, here's Korea. That's nice to know. And we've got... How many hammers here? 17? You could use more. Hmm. Trying to decide whether or not to go build a mine or a farm. How about I split the difference? Come over here onto this forested hill. And actually, I could come across here and set up a... Yeah, I could set up a camp there and get one hammer and, and three... One hammer out of the three apples. I think that's what I'm going to do. Okay. So what was I saying? I was talking about the Angles and their society and their kingdoms. Okay, so there start to be a couple of kingdoms which are just head and shoulders above all the others. And interestingly, these kingdoms all seem to have relatively decent relations with one another. In fact, at any one time, the nation that was the first among equals... Like, we're all kings, we're all warrior kings of the Angles, but we we nod our head to the fact that Bob over there has more warriors of greater strength than anybody else right now. That guy was called the, um, what's the term? Brett Walder. And that term means the wielder of Britain. So the fellow who has Britain in his hand, like you wield a sword, your hand grips the, the hilt of the sword. The Bretwalder was the king who held Britain in his hand and wielded it like a sword. So there were, first first was the Bretwalder, and then there were all of the other kings, and then there were the peasants. All right, and one other thing which I'll say about Angle and, and generally Anglo-Saxon society is that it was not at all uncommon for them to share rule amongst one another. For instance, if in a kingdom, if there's two or three brothers, they would all be like simultaneously king. And in a cool way, they didn't stab one another in the back or anything. I, I haven't heard any evidence of it. It seemed like they got along as brothers and they ruled as uh, warrior brothers, as a triumvirate of simultaneously all three of them being king. So that's cool. And the last thing is is that the notion of what's it called, prima gentry or something like that, uh, the notion that when the king dies, his oldest son becomes king, that hereditary notion, that didn't exist fully yet. There were some Ang Anglo-Saxon kingdoms which started to follow this practice, but many of them didn't, and didn't for hundreds of years. So when the king would die, then there would be a moot or the thanes would all get together and discuss and the aldermen what are we going to do now who's the most suited to being king and sometimes that took years and it was it was messy all right i'm so distracted now by tech talking about the anglo-saxons i've actually forgotten what i'm doing at all i should probably send this warrior across to guard my worker and it looks like we are done here setting up a farm for Nottingham. I think that means that I'm going to... Ooh, how much food do I have here? I've got an excess of three. This Nottingham is a great city. It is a great city. I can expect to have a settler down here in about 12 turns. I've got time for one more project. I think it'll be that. Ah, I'll never get by. I'll never get by if I don't do something about it. You think I can kill that one guy? Do I still have a chance to run away? I do still. Okay, I'm at a I'm at a point here where I can either kill this one galley, 
where I could run if I had another day. I'm starting to feel like if I never fight, I'm never going to get through here. Hmm. All right, well, I'm probably going to regret that. That dry room's probably going to die. Oh my gosh, it's 610. Time just flies when you click. I'm, I'm almost thinking that my next game's going to have to be Marathon because it's just simply too much time passes when I click next turn. Back to my notes. 625. Wow. Okay, so. Brett Walder. That was... Um, Chorlin became Brett Walder. That's right. Chorlin of Wessex became Brett Walder. So that's why I was explaining it. So for a little while, anyway, Wessex was first among equals. That didn't last long. There was another Angle kingdom called um, Mercer, Mercer, Mercia, which uh, most often held that title. But for a little while, Chorlin had it. In 565, a Christian monk from Moville on the continent. That's probably pronounced some fancy French way. I don't know. Anyway, so this Christian monk went into self-imposed exile. I'm going to go retreat to an island in the middle of nowhere and live in, a, live in a cave. Yeah, and that's what he did. He went to a small island called Iona off of Scotland. And he set up a monastery there. And that monastery ended up influencing Britain and Scotland and Ireland in big, big ways. 568, Chorlin of the West Saxons fought one of the few battles that I read about between Anglo-Saxons. He fought Ethelbert of Kent at this time. Uh, the two were both vying for territory in southeast, uh, southeast Britain. Apparently the battle took place at Wibbedom, where Wibbedom is, I don't know, and I don't think anybody knows. I think that place has been lost to history. 575, Chorlin, still of the West Saxons, just, you know, I'm going to try to follow the, the line of the House of Wessex, actually, as I go through. Along with another lord of his house, Cuthwine, fought and killed three British kings at a place called Durham, winning for the West Saxons, Gloucester, Shirenchester, or Siren. Chester and Bath. So that battle saw the final collapse of British power in Britain. In 580, that monastery had started to spread Christianity and it was mixing with the local Celtic faith and establishing itself all across Britain. It was starting to permeate. In 584, let's see, Chorlin, still in power, Fighting with the Mercians, north of the Thames, it seems to have lost the Battle of Mercia. And that competition between Wessex and Mercia. So if Mercia is like right here in central England, and Wessex, if I'm thinking, is like down here, and they would fight over the River Thames. Is this Thames? This might be. I'm honestly not sure. That might be Thames. So, what I believe Thames was the northern boundary of Wessex, and if that's the case, then this was probably Mercia, and this down here was Wessex. And so they fought and lost to Mercia, and you're going to see a lot of Mercia beating up on Wessex for the next 100 or 200 or 300 years. Um, Chorlin's nephew, Chow, Chol, usurps and decides to take for himself the land of the West Saxons and actually defeats Chorlin at Woden's Barrow. Chorlin and his family escape a short distance, but in 592, the usurper, Chol, catches up with them and murders all of Cholin's family. Uh, Chorlin's family. Except for, and this is one of those times where history gets really cool. One of Chorlin's sons escapes the murder. And this fellow's name is Cuthwine. So I'm going to go over these names again just so that it's clear. Chorlin. Oh, and we'll wrap it up here in a minute. But anyway, Chorlin was the king of the West Saxons. And he gets usurped by his nephew, Chol, who fights and defeats Chorlin at Woden's Barrow. Chorlin and his family escape, but a year later, Chol catches up with them and kills all of them, but he misses one son, Cuthwine. 
Now this is where we get straight up like fantasy novel, okay? This guy Cuswine escapes. Imagine him running away from the burning house with his slaughtered family, cursing the usurper. 597, that monk from Mulville in his monastery off Iona, he died, but by this time, he'd set up, that monastery was running without him at this point. So that monastery's just chugging out religious pressure all over Britain right now. In 600, Augustine of Canterbury comes across. So Canterbury, I don't even know what that is. Anyway, um, I guess it's someplace in Britain. I guess Augustine got his name of Canterbury because he was based in Canterbury, but he came from Rome. Okay, I'm going to start over. 600, this guy Augustine comes from Rome to Canterbury in Britain, and his mission was to convert Kent. And when he gets here, he's like, wow, this place is half converted to Catholicism already. This is cool. My job's going to be a lot easier. In 605, Cuswine, the boy who fled the burning house when his family was murdered by the usurpers, he comes back and stages a political return to power. He, he doesn't manage to outright kill the usurpers and become king of the West Saxons. Instead, he does some kind of crafty political maneuver, which I don't know the details to, and he manages to establish a power-sharing agreement with um, Chol and Chol's brothers. So now he says, ah, you killed my father and all of my family, but I'm back, and now you have to share power with me. And that had to be a bitter drink. In 607, Britain was now comprised of the following kingdoms. We're going to run through them real quick. Northumbria, Mercia, so I think Northumbria was up here, Mercia was here, Wessex was here. I don't know where all of these are, but I'll try. Where is it? Okay, Kent. I think Kent was over here. Sussex, I'm assuming that was the land of the South Saxons. Essex, which I'm assuming was the land of the East Saxons. And East Anglia. I don't even know where East Anglia was. There were a couple of smaller English kingdoms at the time who were subject to the bigger guys. And there were still a few British ones. They didn't wield significant power. Uh, that was destroyed by the West Saxons. The, the, the wielding of significant local indigenous power was defeated. They were, they were broken by the West Saxons. But there were still a few small British ones... One was Almet, which eventually would go on to become West Yorkshire, and Demonia, which the cities of Demonia are in current day Cornwall, Devon, Dorset, and Somerset. In 610, because I'm still catching up, King Ethelbert of Kent married a Christian. And hearing Augustine's method, message, remember this is the guy who came across with the, with the goal of converting Kent, so now he's, he's whispering Christianity into King Ethelbert's ear and gets him to marry a Christian girl, manages to convert King Ethelbert. So I guess that um, Augustine can consider himself successful. 625, King Ethelbert of Kent starts minting coins. This is the first time that coinage has been minted in Britain since the departure of the Roman legions. So that is, as far as we'll go in history today, what can we do in this turn before we uh, cut the end of the episode? Okay, so, super. We killed a barbarian and lived to survive the day? I think I'm going to just not go any further with the trireme right now. I'm gonna build this camp, get this warrior down here. Oh good, that was that was well timed. And shoot, I clicked next turn. Maybe I should talk more about No no no. I won't talk any more about history. We'll we'll talk history when we get back. But I just wanna play one more turn. No, we're gonna stop right there. Thank you for listening. If you've made it this far, thank you so much. If you liked the episode or if you didn't like it, go click those buttons. If you want to hear more like this one, then click subscribe. And I'm sorry I never got the extra cities up, but put two more turns and we'll have a settler. So thank you very much.